everybody. I'm Mark. I'm a recovered alcoholic. How are we all doing today? Um, what an honor and a privilege to be here today and, and be at a meeting at 2 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time. Um, it's great to be at a mid, you know, mid-afternoon meeting. Um, so I'm in South Florida. I'm not from South Florida. Let me let me get some particulars out of the way. Um, my sobriety date is December 18th of 2018. I have a sponsor. I do sponsor. That's the way it was taught to me. One hand up, one hand down. My first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous was 1996. So there's there's lots of time in there. And and there's lots, and I'm going to get into kind of like, and, and kind of tie it up and, and get into steps three and four, but I think it's important to give you like a foundation of where I was before, before that. Um, I'm 53 years old. Um, I have two daughters. I have, I'm a grandfather. Uh, I'm a vet. Uh, I was in the Air Force for 12 and a half years. Um, I work in the behavioral health care community for almost 20. Um, so I, I kind of like, and I didn't ask for that. And, and I share that just with you, just because I want to just show the impact of step one in my life, because, you know, no matter, you know, it talks about in the big book, how self-knowledge avails is nothing. And that's been my experience. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what I know, it matters what I do. And, and I'm going to kind of get into that. Uh, the first, my first drink was in, I was about 13 years old and it was blackberry brandy and I've never had blackberry brandy since. Um, I, I did, I, my father had like this, like nuclear, like, you know, like this, like, uh, storage in the basement. And it had like all pantry items and alcohol and, and stuff like that. And my father was dry at the time. Um, you know, my adopted dad. And so I, I used to sneak out and and that was my charge with a group of boys that I hung out with. When we stuck out, it was like, I was like, hey, I'll bring the alcohol. And I just remember, you know, feeling that warm, fuzzy feeling. And I just, I liked it. I really liked it. Now I liked it so much, I got sick to the point where I haven't touched it ever since, but, but believe me, I, I, I've drank everything. I've drank everything else, you know, and, and then some, and other non-conference approved substances as well. Um, I want to say before alcohol though, sugar was probably my, my drug of no choice. Uh, love sugar. I used to go into the, uh, the pantry uh, or the, on the, you know, they have the, the ceramic, like with flowers in one, sugars in another on your kitchen counter. And I couldn't wait till my parents weren't in the kitchen because I could load up on sugar. So that's kind of like how that worked for me for a very long time. Like I, I always wanted to be out of myself. I wasn't okay sitting with myself and I always needed to be energized, you know, to get out of myself. Um, I was adopted. Uh, that's not what makes me an alcoholic and an addict. Uh, being adopted doesn't. Having my mother die when I was six, that doesn't make me an alcoholic and an addict. Uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that um, the things that have happened to me, they happen to people who aren't alcoholic and addicts. You know, what I, you know and, and, and I blame that for a very long time on why I was well, the way I was. Well, if this happened to you, you drink like this too. And you'd use, like, you'd use drugs like this too. And, uh, you know, there came a point in my recovery where I, where I was just left, where I couldn't do that any longer. Um, you know, I, I talk about that first meeting and I, I went to AA at, because uh, things weren't good. <laughs> so, let's, let, I mean, I don't think we walk into AA or whatever A you're in and like we walk in there because life is good and it's like, hey, I just want to do some self-help stuff. And like, it just looks like this, this seems like a good thing. Now, with that being said, uh, I believe very strongly that uh, the world could use a 12-step program and either you have a drinking or drug problem or not. I think the world would be a better place if we all practice the 12 steps. I just, I just believe that. Um, you know, I know people who, are, who have expressed to me that they're extremely jealous of the fact. And I'm like, well, go ahead, work the steps. You know what I mean? Because for me, recovery is a pretty simple equation. Recovery is getting together with the God of my understanding, and it's about life balance. That's what that's what recovery is, and getting me out of the way. That's what it's about. Ultimately, that's what recovery is about for me, the way I understand recovery today. 
and I am not a I am not a one and done as as evidenced by the way I described my timeline in the beginning. So I was introduced to AA. I was in the military, and I always talk about I'm a fast riser and a hard faller, and that means that I, I'm one of those who, uh, when I put my mind to something, um, I I'm usually successful outside of uh, outside of recovery. Okay, outside of recovery, and and what had happened to me was uh, I was in the military. I got picked up to become an officer, and um, I was released from active duty uh, to go back to school. And when that happened, um, you know, it also coincided with a divorce. It also coincided with me having a ten-month-old daughter I couldn't see, and and it was like it, the wheels came off. You know, the wheels came off, and when the wheels came off, the wheels really came off. Um, to the point where I wound up being, you know, I've been homeless, I've been to federal prison, I've been homeless, I've been divorced. Um, so all the things that when we walk in the rooms, the 12 step rooms that like we hear about, you know, the things that we forget, the things that the first step tells us that we're going to forget the strange mental blank spot of prison, the strange mental blank spot of divorce, the strange mental blank spot of estrangement from children, the strange mental blank spot of loss of career. Like I, um, you know, I, I just remember that. And thank you for, for asking me again to speak because, you know, when I say that, it just brings it to the forefront, but not from a place of self-pity and morbid. It, it's more of a place of gratitude. It's more of a place of thank God that I've been given away and people have loved me till I can't love, couldn't love myself, you know, which took a long time. But I want to say from 96 to 2003, um, I wanted to continue to use non-conference approved other substances, dry goods, and, and, or I wanted to drink, but not do that. And, and so I had a hard time initially identifying with alcoholism. There was no doubt that drug addiction was a part of, was a part of my life, you know, but I didn't, I, I drove drunk all the time, but I never got caught, right? So when I talk about the simple, the, the thing called grace, you know, that the spiritual term grace, all grace means to me, and the way I explain it is receiving something that I, I didn't deserve by my actions, right? So how many DUIs should I have? A gajillion. How many do I have? Did I wind up getting? One. You know what I mean? But, but that also what helped support my denial mechanism of not being an alcoholic, you know, I'm like, I only have one DUI, you know, a lot of people get one DUI, you know, but, but when I drank, I drank for effect, like the doctor's opinion talks about, I drank for the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once that I see others taking with impunity. Like I, I, I thought I was, in, in, you know, full of impunity, but the reality of it was, was I went to four years of college and I completed seven classes. So, I mean, was there, was there consequences there? Yeah. You know, when we, when we look at that first step and we look at the jaywalker, right, which I love the jaywalker story because the jaywalker story describes to me the progression and, you know, and being able, I needed someone like you to show me my progression because I'll do everything to minimize it. Divorce, you know, driving, in, although not getting caught, driving under the influence spending money. Like I remember asking my family for money when I was in college. And, and the reality was that if I didn't drink the way I did, I wouldn't need the money that I asked for. That's the reality of it. You know what I mean? But it was really hard to see stuff like that when you're, when you're 24, 25 years old, you know, what was easy to see was renting my car out to drug dealers. What was easy to see was writing bad checks. You know what I mean? That was just like, boom, in your face. But, but so it was hard for me to see my alcoholism as, as it relates to alcohol. The way I understand recovery today, it's not about alcohol or drugs for me. It's about uh, the problem has been me. The alcohol and the drugs have been my solution. That stopped working, you know, and I had, a, I had a, it took me a long time. So from 96 to 2003, I wanted to manage my alcoholism. I wanted to be able to drink because after all, 26, 27, how am I supposed to meet my soulmate, right? Uh, like, it, doesn't everybody meet their soulmate in a bar? Like, that's what I, I honestly believe. My, my perception of reality was way off.
You know, today it's funny because um, I get to work with a lot of a lot of guys that are like in their mid twenties to late late twenties to early thirties. It's a different it's a different landscape today. You have fentanyl. You have you have a lot of different things going on. But um, you know, and, and when and they ask me that same question, how am I supposed to like you know? Because my sociability has always been revolved around other uh, around substances to an unhealthy degree. You know, to where, you know, one is too many and a thousand never enough. Like, I understand that today. In, 2000, in 2003, um, something happened. Like, I was exposed to the book. I, I, I understood, and I know you guys have probably heard, if, you know, talking to Steve a little bit before the meeting, you know, talking about fellowship versus program, you know, is what came to mind in my mind when we were talking. And, and you know, I, I didn't understand the difference between fellowship and program. I really didn't. I, I thought that AA was dollar therapy. I thought when if I put a dollar in the basket, I thought that meant that um, somebody was going to tell me what to do with my girlfriend. Somebody was going to give me a job that that made sense for me. I that's what I thought AA was. I mean, that's how primitive you know I was in my thought patterns. Like I didn't, I you know, I thought it was cheap therapy. And you guys were going to tell me because I heard things like, you know, keep coming back. Don't, don't quit until the miracle, you know, stuff like that. Nobody said, like, the answer is in here. Nobody said, like, do you have a sponsor, you know? And I'm not saying, you know, what I've learned is that those, those individuals that came across my path, they weren't trying to hurt me at all. They just, you know, I, I, just, I just believe that some people don't have to do what it says in this book about the moderate drinker, the hard alcohol, you know, the real alcoholic. Like, I'm the real deal. Like, it says what I have to do in here, but you know, so I started opening this book and, and God started putting people in my life that probably had the answer, but I wasn't willing, you know, there's, there's, I was in compliance. I wasn't in surrender. If that makes sense. I wanted to keep the wife, I wanted to keep the job. The military supported alcohol use uh, back then. I don't, I'm not quite sure what their stance is today, but you know, it was like alcohol was legal. You know, the legality of, of substances, it was pretty simple. It was like, if it was illegal, bad. If it was legal, good, learn how to manage it. You know what I mean? So it, it was crazy. And I grew up where, uh, like I said, I was adopted. My adopted dad, um, you know, was an alcoholic, still is. Um, and my biological father, who I found when I was 20, that's, that's, a story, that's a story in itself. He was a compulsive gambler. So, like, when you look at the nature versus nurture debate for me, like, I mean, I had some cards stacked against me a little bit. Um, you know, uh, interesting fact, they say, you know, a, you know, compulsive gambling is a process addiction. And when you look at that, you know, there's no substance, but the MRIs on brain scans light up the same for a cocaine addict as they do for a compulsive gambler. You know, so, but I, I and I can, I can get down with that. Gambling never was my thing though, but, um, you know, cocaine was my thing. Alcohol was my thing. I like to go up and, you know, kind of the other one kind of brings me down, that kind of thing. So from two, from 96 to 2003, my story was, you know, I'm going to go to meetings. I'm going to find the answer, what somebody's great share, and I'm going to go from there. And when I'm done with the meeting, I'm, I'm done, you know, 2003, something happened. Um, I got out of prison and I had another bottom. I lived in, in South Carolina at the time, lost my military career, hit a bottom, was living in my car. And uh, I went back up to New Jersey and, and, you know, and I prayed that I would do something different. And I, I, I started going to meetings and I happened to stumble. And I say stumble because, you know, one of my favorite, you know, there's a there's Mark H. Maybe some of you have heard, heard of him. Maybe some of you haven't. Um, Mark, Mark H, you know, you, how do you know what you don't know? Love that. Um, so I, how do you know what you don't know? I didn't know what I suffered from and I didn't know what the solution was. So God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And I stumbled in a program, a, a solution based meeting where, where I was basically told to shut up and keep coming. And like, and that this book held the answer to that considering, you know, I consider myself somewhat, um, you know, intelligent as far as being college educated, but I tell you, I opened this book and I didn't understand the damn thing. There was lots of those doubts. I mean, like a lot of, you know, 1934, 19, you know, all this stuff was in here and I didn't understand it. 
and I needed somebody to translate that uh, to me, you know, and, um, and, and God put that person into my life and things began to change. Um, you know, with that being said, um, so my history, I've put together two stretches of seven and a half years sober um, and, and went back out. And, and I didn't go back out um, based on like this overwhelming physical allergy that I couldn't stop. You know, what I learned about in the doctor's opinion was, you know, physical allergy, mental obsession, spiritual malady. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't, when I went back out, I went back out the opposite way. I went back out on spiritual malady, mental obsession, physical allergy. I went back, I, I went in the complete opposite direction. You know, when it talks about in here on uh, page 52, you know, was I having trouble with my personal relationships? Was I couldn't, couldn't control my emotional nature? Was I a prey to misery and depression? When I couldn't make a living, did I have a feeling of uselessness? Was I full of fear? Was I unhappy? Could I seem not to be a real help to other people? All those things were me. I didn't understand that. That was, that was my problem. I didn't understand that on 62. It says that selfishness and self-centeredness, that's the root of my problems. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. And I love stepping on the toes of my fellows. And they retaliate, and I don't know why. Uh, sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we made decisions based on self, which later put me in a position to be hurt. And, you know, I still live, I still, I still, I still, I still, I recently have had something like that too. And I don't like when somebody tells me, you know, like what, what selfish decisions that I make that led up to some kind of pain I'm going in. I mean, like AA, what, a, what, like, like it's a miracle. Like people pay thousands of dollars for this. You know, they go to therapy and, and all this stuff. And it's like, and, and it's always been here. It's just amazing how the spiritual awakening that it talks about in Appendix 2, you know, the educational variety, that that's me. I'm edu I mean, now, mind you, up for a few days, I've, I've definitely had white life spiritual malady. I mean, spiritual awakening. But spiritual, like educational variety all the way. You know, so that first step, you know, without that first step, I talk about, I had it in my head. I could recite what the first step was, but I had a problem with it going to my heart. And I, I don't think I would be willing to do the things that I needed to do in, until, the, until it went to my heart. And I think part of sustained recovery is getting it to stay in my heart, which thank you for helping me with that today, because by doing things like this, it stays in my heart, but not again, not from a place of fear, but of gratitude. And that's, you know, because it talks about that in our 10 step promises. You know, it says that, I mean, I recoil from it from like a hot flame. And that's all. I have to go places because I live a life of service where there's people under the influence. I have to do that. I mean, that's what I'm charged with. That's my purpose. And, and, and but I do it safely and I have to be spiritually fit. To tell you I'm spiritually fit every day, I'd be lying because I'm not. I have moments of spiritual unfitness. And, and when I have done that and I'm not checked with accountability, um, you know, things like seven and a half years. And did I throw that away? No. And so like, you know, and, and I, I walked around with a lot of shame for a long time because of working in the field, having some letters behind my name that says, I know something about addiction and alcoholism and going back out and using and going up and picking up a white chip that, um, that, that has kept me out there and sick because I didn't want to, you know, and I know people have died as a result of it, you know, that shame. Of not of not being humble, I, I understand the difference today between humility and humiliation, you know. And and uh, thank God that I do, um, you know. And it's it, it's just, but time takes time, you know. So it's been a, it's been a journey for me. And and today I want to talk about the third step a little bit. So in where we're gonna go, if you guys have books, is to 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 let me just get it, uh, page sixty. So when, when we talk about the second step real quick, you know, uh, came to believe, came to believe very simply for me was, was a moment that it's ever changing. Came to believe uh, is, is, in fact, I go to came believe, to believe retreats, if you've ever heard of those. Um, you know, it's uh, my concept of, of God is, is ever changing. And, and what I have found on a daily basis is I'm either moving toward God or away from God. 
And, uh, you know, again, thank you again, because you guys helped me today and move toward God. So came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. So my interpretation of could uh, means that there's some conditions on that. But the conditions don't fall on my higher power. The conditions fall on me. Could restore means that I have some work to do. You know, that's how I interpret the second step. Came to believe is a process that is that that's contingent upon my work to stay close to my higher power or not. Uh, I grew up in an Italian family. I grew up Catholic. I grew up, I was an altar boy. I didn't understand a damn thing about why I did what I did. I, I didn't understand the prayers. I, I didn't understand the relationship. I didn't understand, and that's not enough. I had some great experiences, but AA really taught me about my relationship with my higher power, and I'm so grateful for that. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's a conversation for me today, and it looks a lot different than it did years ago. So, again, there's a demonstration of came to believe. Could restore me to sanity. So, here we are. We're at this. It says, being convinced we're at the third step. What, what was taught to me is that there's three requirements for the third step. So, you know, turn my life, my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him. You know, turn my will in my life. And I'm, maybe some of you guys have heard this. Thoughts and actions, will in life, thoughts and actions over to the care of my higher power. It's really hard to do that if I don't have a relationship with my higher power, right? It's like, you know, and I've heard some really, really crazy things. I've heard, you know, doorknobs as higher power, all this stuff. You know, what I know is, is that back to the grace analogy that I used earlier, grace, uh, you, know, you know, I know that something has always watched over me. I felt it, you know, I. I've, I've, I've always felt that I've always known that there was something bigger than me. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I was raised Catholic. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian today. Um, I, I I've been married to a Jewish, I do a Jewish woman. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's all about, it's all about, it's all about God. You know what I mean? I'm more concerned about how we're more alike, how, how our beliefs are the same rather than how they're different you know, and the dogma of all that stuff. But it says here, the first requirement, which I, unbelievably somebody had to show me this, that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. So when I sponsor guys and, and we talk about that, you know, how can self-will, you know, uh, my understanding of my relationship with my higher power is that, you know, we have freedom of choice. You know what I mean? And so like, if you look at in the morning, when it talks about uh, upon awakening, it, it, that, was that was instrumental and though it's it's not at the beginning of the book yeah let us think about the 24 hours ahead we consider my plans we ask god to direct our thinking you know when that was shown to me uh that was like really impactful god to direct my thinking especially being a divorce from self-pity dishonest or self-seeking motives when i look at that self-pity dishonest and self-seeking motives that's what I was all about for a very long time. So I need to be the opposite of that. So my self-will takes me to that. My so, so I need to be the opposite of that. I'm just sharing my experience on how I piece this all together. You know, when I came in here, I know it's on 86, and I know I'm talking about page 60. But for me, that's how, that's how, and so I'll explain it that way, you know, to people about that self-pity, dishonest, because I was feeling sorry for myself. I was a victim. How could these things happen to me? If you were me, you do what I did too, you know? And so sitting quiet is really important to me because I love to talk and I'm not such a good listener. Now there's some other books I read that I talk about, about being a good listener and, and, and slow to speak and, and slow to anger and quick to listen, things like that. And, and like, you know, and I try to track this, I practice more of that today can hardly be a success. My self will, has taken me, again, back to the jaywalker analogy, to prison. It's taken me to divorce court. It's taken me to child support court. It's taken me to loss of, of a career that I love dearly. I love being in the military. Loved it. I mean, 12 and a half years, people are like, it's so funny because, you know, you meet people and AA has taught me discernment. So I don't have to like tell, spill my entire life to people every time I meet somebody, right? They're like, you did 12 and a half years. You were almost there. And I'm just like, yeah. Well, there were some circumstances that changed the, changed the changed the outcome of that a little bit. But my self will has gotten me in, in, in a lot of trouble. But you know what I'll focus on? I'll focus on the things that I shared with you about. Well, I went in and enlisted, got picked up for commission. 
You know, I graduated basic training in, in 10 days, you know, on an accelerated program. I'll, I'll do is I'll look at the, the positive things. And then I think that I can run the show again. And again, like I shared with you earlier about recovery being about life balance. That's, you know what? I'm not, I'm not driving the bus. I'm not in the back of the bus. I'm in the middle of the bus. And later on in steps, you know, it really drove that home for me. So the second requirement, right? The second requirement is on 62. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be my director. You know, I remember it was shown to me kind of like the employer. You know what I mean? Like I work for God. Like I, I could really get down with that. Now, you know, and I can work for God waiting tables in a restaurant. I can work for God driving Uber. I can work for God. You know what I mean? Like I call it undercover. You know what I mean? Like, and there's, there's overtly, there's overt like roles, obviously, that you're working for God, you know, in, in maybe in the uh, in the religious business and stuff like that. But, you know, there's we all work for God. And when I started looking at it, like, you know what, how can I work for you today and do good work? Like that really changed the game. So God's going to be my director. You know, I can see I can feel the wind, but I don't see the wind. And that's kind of like how I look at my relationship with God and the, and the third step. And, you know, on 86, 87, later on, it says we pause when agitated or doubtful. Um, I made a business decision last year and I sold my house and I moved an hour away and I took all of my earnings and I threw it into a start two startup businesses. You know, and I thought about that for about a year before I did it. And, uh, and I prayed about it every day. And about the risk. And is this for selfish reasons? Is this for financial reasons? Is it okay to like want to make money? You know, these are the things that AA taught me. These, these are the things that the third step and about what God's will and, and like having a new director has always is taught. So now I have a thirst to seek, seek God in my life, to ask like what's going on. And I believe God speaks through you. I do. I believe that God speaks through people. And, and a lot of times, let me tell you a little secret, it's used sometimes it's people I don't like, you know, and that's, that's what's really kind of amazing. It's, it's people I, you know, when I, when, when somebody that I have a personality conflict with, and usually that means that they're like me in some way, um, I, I should listen extra close, you know. So the third, the third, the third part about the third step, the way I was taught is at the bottom of 63. But before that, we have the third step prayer, right? That's one of my favorite prayers ever. God, I offer myself to thee. Like when you think about that, like I offer myself to thee. That's pretty, that's deep, man. Like I offer myself in the shower. I offer myself at the gym. I offer myself at work. I offer myself when somebody cuts me off on the highway. I offer myself, you know, when my kids are telling me to F off and hang up on me. I offer myself all the time, you know, uh, to build with me and do with me as that will. Like, wow, like maybe I'm not supposed to, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. Maybe I'm not supposed to do that. You know, like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's unconditional. This prayer is offering myself unconditionally. So I, I offer myself to thee, to build with me and do with me as thou well. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Well, you know, one thing I learned on 5262 is that it's all about me, right? And, and that's what I suffer from the most in, the, in that first step, right? Take away my difficulties, that victory over those, that, that overcoming that stuff is going to be a testimony to my relationship with my higher power. That's what the third step means to me. You know, uh, a victory, to those that would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. Let me be a testimony. Let my, let my life and turning it around be for, be for your glory be, you know, to show others that they can, that they can come out of the dark too. Uh, so the third requirement is pretty simple. It's at the bottom there. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. So when I talk about next, I don't, don't know about you, but when I sponsor guys, I, you know, they're like, okay, let's wait. I'm like, ne what does that say? It says next and launch. Next and launch says nothing about waiting. It says nothing about, well, I did the first three steps. I'm not ready to do a fourth. We'll get together next year. I hear like, I'm not going to do a fourth because I want to be thorough. I, I love that one. Like thorough, huh? I'm like, well, how about you ask God, right? Because now you've had a third step experience, right? You ask God to be as thorough as you're supposed to be on this fourth step and go from there. You know what I mean? It's not like you can't go back, 
right? It's not like you can't go back because that's what a 10 step's all about, right? It's not like, you know, what I do, you know, the way it was taught to me, I go through four through nine once a year. I go, I do one, two, three, 10, 11, and 12 daily. And I do what four through nine annually, right? Because it's I might miss some stuff. And that's kind of like how I do it. So four, I know I'm not done. And that's what I tell them. I'm like, well, give it, give it your best shot, right? So I'm at stop four. And, and, and in that inventory, I could really get down with, you know, because especially in business and bookkeeping, like inventory is good, right? Like I just want to know what's going on. I, I do, a, I have a spreadsheet on my Google Drive for my bills, you know, electrics do here, rents do here. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 that's all a fourth step is. But I think that AA, the fellowship has built up that it's like, it's, it's like the boogeyman. It's like, the, for me, it's like the dentist, right? Like I have this, I don't know where this fear of the dentist comes from. Well, I do. I mean, I've since learned, but, but I did but I just had a fear because it was like the dentist, oh man, you don't want to do that. Right. So you hear a fourth step and you're like, nah, you shouldn't do that. But it's a fact, it says it's a fact finding mission, right? So it's, it's just about looking at the facts on paper and there's an exercise in humility by doing that. Just right there, there's an exercise in doing that. So, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been exposed to numerous ways to do the fourth step um, in my life. And I'm just going to share what, what has worked for me and what I think is indicative of this book. Um, and that is, you know, the, there's four, there's four inventories. Um, there's a resentment inventory, there's a fear inventory, there's a harms inventory, and there's a sex inventory. That's the way it was explained to me. Um, so those, so everybody wants to go to the resentment one first. So I'll, I'll do, I'll kind of go over what my little synopsis, what my fourth step looked like for resentment. And uh, it, in column one, it, that's the easy part, right? So it's who, right? But it's also other things. So it's more than just who. It's institutions, it's principles. So like no sex before marriage, right? There's a principle, there's an example of maybe something you ever resented. Institutions, well, there's judges, there's the court system, right? So, and, and so there's an example of an institution. Then there's obviously people. Usually romantic relationships wind up on there first and foremost. Um, you know, and, and that's great. And that's also what people usually want to run to with the immense process too, especially, especially if they have ulterior motives. Um, and that's, that's my experience with men. So we have the resentment inventory in column, in column one, who, right? And then we love the second column. We love, we love why, you know what I mean? Because that's the, I am King column, right? That's the, like, look at, like, look at what they did to me. So a lot of times when, when I take guys through the work, I have them do the resentment inventory first. I have them do the first two columns first. And I say, come back and we'll meet. Because what I have found is, is a lot of guys, because they're, they're in early recovery, you know, they have, if I just throw out all four columns at them at once, like they, they kind of like, they kind of like lose it. So I give them the first two because that they know, you know, that's why they're here. That's why they were drinking and drugging and everything else. So they get that down just fine. They come back and they meet with me and we look at, we look at three and four. And, and when you look at three, it kind of, it kind of changes, it kind of changes things. So. This was not good for me. So when I looked at column three, you have you have sex relations, self-esteem, um, you have personal relations, you have, you know, all this stuff. I was always given boxes and I checked, but I didn't understand why I was checking them. I, I'm being honest with you. I just kind of like when I went to church, I didn't understand the Hail Mary. I just said it because that's what I was told to do. So I was like sex relations, ex-girlfriend, no problem. I didn't I needed to go a little deeper. So, you know, I had a sponsor, I'm blessed enough to say, who kind of showed me that. So like, so sex relations, he gave me like some keywords. He said like a real man should, and that's kind of like how he helped me get insightful into sex relations. And maybe for a woman to be a real woman would, you know, and that helped me see that because I, I didn't understand that the whole sex part when it came to the fourth step, I thought it was about sex. You know, but but it really later on, even in the sex inventory, it was about my 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 um my pathology in relationships with women that's really what what it, what it came down to it was like how i behaved with women looking at the similarities and then and then think, and asking god's help in removing you know and, and seeking because they were all selfish i mean that's the bottom line so when you look at 
uh, self-esteem, I feel. That helped me like complete that sentence. When you look at security, I need. When you look at ambition, I want. You know what I mean? This helped me see like a little more deeper than checking a box because I, I, I just, I needed more. Like I, I didn't, I wanted to understand like, like what, what, what column three was about. Column four is interesting because that really flips the, the script and it really shows me kind of like leads me into how I'm going to go into six and seven and come up with um, my, my list on who exactly I'm going to make my list to make amends to. You know, how was I selfish? How was I self-centered? How was I fearful? How did it affect my finance? How did, how did I impact finance? You know, I'm sorry, finance is where it's column three. How did it, how was I fearful? And it really got into all those things. If you look at the bottom of, um, da, 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 da. let me just see where I'm at here real quick. Yeah, and it, and, it, and, it, and it flipped the script. When I looked at how I thought and how I acted, it really, really changed things. And you know what I learned from doing my fourth column? I learned that I stole time from people. I, that was like a game changer for me. Like how many nights did my grandmother stay up? How many nights did she worry about me? Um, how many times did I gossip? I didn't think that, I, I, didn't, I didn't see there was anything wrong with gossip. I didn't think there was anything wrong about character assassinating. These things came out and were game changers for me. But I needed a man who was a rec in, rec you know, in a recovered state to show me this because somebody showed him. You know, uh, when I went on to the fear inventory, um, I was scared of everything. You know, and and uh, you know, I thought I kept it down to snakes and bees, but really, I was scared of success. I'll give you some examples. I was scared of having physical, intimate relations with a woman sober. Um, I was scared of uh, doing things that were out of my comfort zone in business that I didn't know, that I wasn't confident in. And again, that non-reliance I got. What it all boiled, boiled down to was am I either, I'm either God-reliant or not. Again, about God-reliance. The sex ideal, I told you, is about my pathology and my relationships, my major relationships. And about, you know, the things that I look for. And the, the big thing about the sex ideal it was, for me, was um, that I had to be everything I, I sought. Like, I wanted a woman. To, I wanted a trustworthy woman. I had to be trustworthy. I wanted a patient woman. I had to be patient. Like, I always had a double standard. Um, you know, I, I didn't think I did. If I talked to you, I would tell you I didn't. But I always did. Um, and this, like, just brought it all, all to the surface for me. You know, I love, I love the, the fourth step prayer on uh, page uh, 67. We ask God to help show him the t same tolerance and pity that we show a sick friend. When a person offended us, we said, this is a sick man or woman. How can I be helpful to them? Like, that's the fourth step prayer. As I was shown, it's on, it's on 67. Um, and it was instrumental, you know, um, you know, it talks about, it, it talks about, I have this written down. I took this note in my big book in 2013 and it says, you cannot have faith and you cannot have fear at the same time. And when you really think about that, I can't, I can't be scared and have faith at the same time. It's almost impossible to do that. Um, you know, I'm not saying you might not feel some of the physical ramifications of that, sweating or anxious or something like that. But if you're living in faith, it's, 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 it's you know, that will, in my, in my experience, you'll over, always, always overcome that. So that was my experience with the third and the fourth step and a little bit about me and my recovery journey. I'm grateful to be here, and I hope I brought you a message of recovery. Thanks for letting me share, Christy.